There are few examples of continuous flintknapping traditions that lasted into recent times to be recorded by ethnographers. One of these few examples comes from the Kimberley region of northwest Australia. When European colonists came into the region, they observed people from the indigenous nations of the region making and using bifacial projectile points. Later, ethnographers described the flintknapping process used by these indigenous Australians. These bifacial points were important as hunting tools, but also as goods of exchange, and made their way well outside the Kimberley region across exchange networks. Over time, glass even became a popular material for making these points, which became increasingly sought after by tourists and collectors. In this video, I flintknap one of these points, called Kimberley points, and discuss this uniquely preserved flintknapping tradition in the lives of the people who made them and called the Kimberley region home. The Kimberley region is located in the state of Western Australia and has an area of around 422,000 square kilometers. Here the climate can be characterized as tropical and semi-arid. Temperatures are very hot, with the minimum temperatures in the coldest month of the year rarely falling below 18 degrees Celsius, which is 65 degrees Fahrenheit. The climate is strongly seasonal, with almost all rainfall occurring between December and March, with the span from July to September commonly being rainless. Between the rainy and dry seasons, there are short transitional periods. Much of the rain comes from thunderstorms, but most of the heavy falls are the result of cyclones. This strong seasonality played a large role in the activities of the people who lived in the region for thousands of years. The ancestors of contemporary indigenous nations have been occupying Australia since at least 50,000 years ago. Groups living in the Kimberley region around the time of colonization include those belonging to the Warora, Umidam, and Yahweh Jibaya language groups. Projectile point technology first appears in the Australian archaeological record around 5,000 years before present. These points were made with direct percussion and include both unifacial and bifacial classes of points. People before this time used different strategies for hunting technology than stone projectile points. The use of pressure flaking for producing bifaces seems to have become widespread by 1,000 years before present, which includes the first appearance of Kimberley points. The exact dating of Kimberley points is still poorly understood, as their recovery from datable archaeological contexts is infrequent. Four types of bifacial points are proposed for the Kimberley region by archaeologists. These include Wanji, Northern Territory Triangular, Kimberley, and Kimberley Dentate. Wanji and Northern Territory Triangular points occur in the records of Western and Southwestern Arnhem Land. Wanji points are known ethnographically, while Northern Territory Triangular points are known prehistorically. Kimberley points were produced in the Kimberley region, but were also widely distributed from there. Kimberley dentate points are known only prehistorically, while Kimberley points are known ethnographically as well. Kimberley points are teardrop shaped and known to have fine serrations and denticulations along their margins, created by pressure flaking. Nearly all hafted examples of Kimberley points are under 6 cm long, with most being under 4 cm. Thanks to ethnographies, we have a detailed understanding of how Kimberley points were manufactured from the viewpoint of an observer watching a flint napper. Preformed blanks were produced by direct percussion using a hammer stone. Ethnographic accounts describe that Kimberley nappers were always keeping an eye out for usable pieces of material as they went about various daily tasks. The napper would pick up a rock from the immediate area to use as a hammer stone and test the piece. 
if the testing revealed it to be a good piece of rock, Flint Napper would reduce it into a preform and put it into a paper bark wallet for later reduction. These wallets would sometimes contain over a dozen blanks ready for later manufacture. The process by which indigenous people from the Kimberley employ pressure flaking is different than the techniques used by most modern flint nappers. They would sit on the ground with one leg tucked under the other, the top leg stretched out before them. The napper would use a stone anvil, about 15 by 15 by 12 centimeters in dimensions, as a working surface. The stone surface would be cushioned by bark from trees from the genus Melouka known by the common names of paper bark, honey myrtle, or tea tree. The preformer would be set on this bark on its edge, grasped in a pinch by the napper between the thumb and the forefinger. Pressure flaking tools would be held like a dagger, with the working end emerging from the bottom of the hand below the little finger. Pressure was applied by the napper, leaning forward and pressing down and outward with the tool. The first stage of pressure flaking, a hammer stone reduced blank, was done with a hardwood pressure flaker. This type of tool removed broad, flat flakes with bending initiations and little discernible bulbs. Next, pressure flaking was done with the bone tool. Kangaroo or wallaby almas were a common choice, although freshwater crocodile mandible, splinters of human tibia, and dugong rib were also recorded as being used. After the more refined flaking of the bone tool, the final shaping would begin. The napper would start to develop the distal tip and remove flakes on one face only, forming a midline on this face. The face with the midline was referred to as the ilatu, the spine or back of the point. The opposite face was called the ingulum in the warora language, the belly of the point. The intent of creating a spine on the one face was to serve as a strengthening design element. The last step involved using a spatulate or chisel-shaped pressure flaker to scrape the margins and create the needle tip of the point. As time went on, metal wire began to be used as a pressure flaker for making Kimberly points. As you can see, I'm not using a completely traditional process for this Kimberly point. All of the percussion for producing Kimberly points would have been done with hammer stones instead of the antler billets that I'm using. Similarly, I'm not using the right kinds of wood and bone pressure flakers, but instead I'm using antler for most of my pressure flaking, although I do use bone for the serrations. At the time of napping, I was also not aware that the final stages of pressure flaking were focused on one face, so my reproduction is also inaccurate in that regard. Kimberly points were manufactured from chert, quartzite, crystal quartz, silicrete, agate, jasper, and glass. Glass used for making Kimberly points was usually bottled glass, but flat glass and telegraph insulators were also used. I'm using Georgetown Flint from Texas for making my Kimberly point. Both finished Kimberly points and preforms were stored in paper bark wallets. Finished points were individually cushioned with bird down or bulrushes to prevent breakage and the dulling of the edge. Larger points, like the glass ones, had their tips wrapped in soft fiber to keep this particularly delicate portion from breakage. A 1936 ethnography by Love describes these paper bark wallets. This bark wallet, the Baruru, is a cigar-shaped roll of soft bark, bound with fiber string. Inside is a nest of down, usually with a bulrush, in which rest finished spearheads, pieces of stone in different stages of manufacture, the tools used in their making, and nowadays, quite usually a stick or two of tobacco, or perhaps a small bit of tobacco according to the man's financial state. Bark wallets were also known to contain small lumps of resin, sinew, and boabab fiber string. When points were needed, they could be removed and hafted. The most common application of Kimberly points was for tipping hunting spears, which were thrown with the aid of a spear thrower. These spears were composite, with different sections being made from different materials. Phragmites reeds were used for the main shaft, which was about 1.5 to 2 meters long. Kimberly points themselves were hafted onto four shafts, 
which were a separate piece socketed into the main shaft. The joint between the two often aided with the use of beeswax. The foreshaft was a piece of acacia, mangrove, or eucalyptus about a meter in length. The distal end of the foreshaft is bound in sinew to prevent splitting, but was not actually used to bind the point to the foreshaft. Instead, Kimberly points were embedded in a knob of resin on the end of these foreshafts. Resin from both Spinifex or native cypress would have been used for making the glue. Resin was applied in a heated liquid state and molded with the fingers to ensure a good half between the point and the foreshaft. This method of hafting solely with the resin permits the point to occasionally release from the shaft upon impact, minimizing damage to the point. A drawback of this hafting technique did mean that points were prone to slumping over time, especially in hot temperatures. Regular maintenance of hunting gear was employed to keep spears in reliable condition. Hunting spears tipped with Kimberly points were thrown using a spear thrower. Spear throwers from the northern Kimberly range from 90 to 130 centimeters in length. Another function of Kimberly points is that they were also used as knives. Still mounted to the spear foreshaft, this was gripped near or at the resin mounting and used to cut in a tip-down, spear-shaft-up manner. Points that detached upon impact were also used by hunters to butcher the very animal that they'd been used to kill. Kimberly points made for use on spears were generally less than 6 centimeters long. Many examples, especially glass points, were longer than this. People indigenous to the Kimberley area also produced more points than they needed for everyday use. So what did they do with all these extra points, especially the large ones? Kimberley points were common items of exchange. In pre-contact times, people exchanged points over an exchange network, resulting in goods moving both near and far from where they were produced. In pre-contact times, this exchange network can be conceived of like a fine mesh over the continent. Chains of exchange partners were called Wunan or Winan. Goods initially moved within a local area, exchanged with kin and personal exchange partners. These goods were exchanged to maintain complex systems of reciprocity, rights, and obligations. The fine nature of this exchange mesh meant that goods were exchanged first between adults of a local group, and then to adjacent groups connected by kinship ties. Objects progressively moved outward from local to extra-local groups of people. However, the immediate exchange web was likely the outer limit for the movement of most goods, including Kimberley Points. After European contact, Aboriginal relocation disrupted people's lives, including aspects like exchange networks. After this time, these networks can be imagined as having a larger mesh with more linear exchanges between isolated centers. Over the last 100 years, large Kimberley points, often made from glass, were produced mostly for exchange, rather than hunting. Tourists and collectors were increasingly incorporated into this exchange. Indigenous groups from the Kimberley hunted and gathered for a variety of food resources. Most, though not all, of the populations in the Kimberley were relatively close to coastal or riverine areas. As such, it was common for them to make use of both terrestrial and marine sources of food. Along the coast, fish, turtles, turtle eggs, and dugong were important food resources. Fishing was an important source of food for people in the Kimberley. When an individual's fishing, they use a pronged wooden spear for the task. A more effective method were the communal fish drives. People would form a human fence and use branches and wads of grass to beat the water and drive the fish into a shallow dead end, where they could be scooped up by hand. Large hunting parties of men took place in kangaroo hunts from around May to July, in the dry season. They would use burns to drive the kangaroos, and speared them as they ran from the flames. Communal kangaroo hunts like this 
or exclusively a male activity. After several kangaroos were taken, the men would immediately cook them and eat as much as they could right on the spot. Only if there were leftovers would any be taken back to the group for women and children. However, groups of women would act similarly. Groups of women out foraging for the day would sometimes capture kangaroos with the aid of their dogs. In such a case, women would cook and consume the kangaroo then and not bring it back to camp to share with the men. Ethnographic accounts stress that women were the primary food providers. Women forged for roots, fruits, small game, honey, all staple foods that were much more reliable than the food resources that men would target. Women forged in groups of around six individuals, who were each accompanied by three to four dogs. Dogs were an incredibly useful hunting companion for catching small game animals. Ethno-archaeological data shows that in the past, war or societies, one of those to occupy the Kimberley region, were organized into clans. Each clan belonged to a bounded territory, which had both a name and known defined boundaries. Clans were subject to fusion and fission over time, so these boundaries were not immutable per se. Clans had exclusive rights to these estates for hunting and religious purposes. However, settlement and foraging ranges were not limited to these clan boundaries. Each clan had one or more painted shelters within these clan territories, which were used for important ceremonial activities. These shelters had brightly colored motifs of ancestral spiritual figures known as Wanjina. Alongside these figures, other motifs were drawn including mythological figures, animals, plants, and objects of material culture. These plants and animals were totems of the clan. Additionally, each clan had their own named Wanjina. Clan members were responsible for repainting the motifs in these shelters on a yearly basis, at the end of the dry season. This activity was done to ensure that rains would come to replenish the earth, which would in turn replenish the clan totems and named Wanjina within the natural world. The residential land-using groups indigenous Australian people lived in were bands. Bands are distinct from the clan and are highly flexible in terms of size and composition. Bands could be as small as a single family unit to more than 50 people depending on the time of year and the kinds of resources that were available. Residential mobility was influenced by natural factors such as seasonal weather and food resources but also cultural factors such as tension between groups or a desire to visit people in other groups. Mobility was often part of a seasonal round. During the rainy season, more inland groups would travel to coastal groups of relatives, since these areas had abundant food resources during this time of year. Rock shelters were primarily used during the wet season for protection from the rain. In the dry season, camps were built in the open. It is rare for anthropologists to observe or even use first-hand observations of how stone tools played a role in the everyday lives of hunter-gatherers. The indigenous groups who inhabited Australia's Kimberley region are one such exceptional example. The stone and later glass Kimberley points that they made were important for hunting tools, but also items of exchange to maintain social alliances and connections within and between hunting groups. Over time, the production of these bifacial tools became less important for hunting and were increasingly sold or traded to collectors and tourists. The production of stone tools isn't the only aspect of culture that is valuable for anthropologists to observe. First-hand accounts from people who spent time with the indigenous groups from the Kimberley during the 19th and 20th centuries showcase the diverse aspects of hunter-gatherer life that just doesn't tend to show up in the archaeological record. These indigenous groups aren't just a people of prehistory or of ethnographic accounts, but they still call Australia's Kimberley region their home. <laughs>